Oscar Out Loud is a weekly podcast about San Francisco real estate from the Jackson Fuller team, San Francisco Realtors since 2002. Show notes with links are at jacksonfuller.com. Hi, Bretton. Hi, Matt. How are you? Oh, you know, things are just so crazy. So, you, you know what my favorite answer is when people ask me how San Francisco real estate is? What? Unbelievable. Living the dream. It's always true. It is. Because I can always tell you a story that you will not believe, and it will be a true story. I believe what you just said is the truth. All right. So, uh, a few weeks ago, our listeners really enjoyed when we uh, just crazy loose and went with a game show format. Woo-woo. And uh, then, of course, I was... Terrified of the positive reception that got and immediately decided we had to rename it uh, Which is where we are with question that answer Which is also what we happen to do every day. We just don't get people answers to their real estate questions We actually help them Understand that answer and make sure it makes sense Indeed we do indeed we do but it also works as a game show like that one on television with uh, that Gentleman who if you added an a at the end of his name uh, Would be a home device that is the number one listening device for our at-home listeners. What is Alexa? Very good. <laughs> I Feel like we're ready with no further ado here um, So the uh, motivation for this episode is I just came back from the California Association of Realtors uh, annual not annual third uh, business meeting of 2018 and the final business meeting and in addition to doing lots of stuff, I generally try to learn lots of stuff. You're such a dork. Thank you. And one of the things I've learned is some really overdue changes to real estate terminology that are being encoded uh, and the state law, the statute, whatever the technical words are for it, but the legally correct words that we are finally uh, encouraged, uh, required, slash that are pre-printed in the forms are being updated. This is California AB 1289 and 2884. And it was actually legislation that the California Association of Realtors uh, helped sponsor and encourage. Yeah, and it's so long overdue. And we'll we'll get into when we play question that answer, we'll we'll get into some of the nitty-gritty of it. Exactly. Uh, so let's start with, you know, let's start with a super simple one. The person buying the property. Ooh, ooh. What is, well, should, oh, should, pre-AB 1289 or post? Well, pre, as it stands today. Um, because 1289 goes into effect on January 1, 2019. That is my understanding, correct, yes. So, the person buying the property. Could I, could I answer to an important disclaimer right here? I'm Please sorry. interrupt me. We are not attorneys. And this is not legal advice. We're also not risk management brokers, so this is not risk management advice. This is just a game show with a host that should shut up now. <laughs> As I was saying... Let's start from the top, Britain. The person buying the property. What is the transfer E? Isn't that confusing? But correct. Well, it is correct, and it's annoying, but, it's, off, going, but how, it's going away. Yes, how often do you say, hey, I'm the transfer E? I never. But what do people say? They say they're the buyer. Yes. And the forms are now going to say buyer. Ding, ding, ding. We love that answer. See, sometimes the legislature does manage to do something that makes sense. We helped them. <laughs> <laughs> the person selling the property. Oh, oh. Pre-1289, what is the transfer or? That is correct. There is no or about it, although there is an or at the end of transfer, which no one ever says except for when you were reading real estate documents. So now, come January 1, 2019, what do we get to call the transferer? Transfer or? This is so much easier. Seller. What's the seller? Sorry. Ding, ding, ding. Crazy. Goodbye, transfer E. Goodbye, transfer or. It's just another word I can't say. One less word to mangle in 2019. Thank you, California legislature. When the transferor sits on the apostrophe. <laughs> and has to drive on O'Shaughnessy. You said it right. <laughs> it's only taken me 16 years. What's the state where um, its initials are MA? <laughs> Massachusetts. <laughs> we'll have to work on that one. Focus. Exactly. 
Uh, information that relates to the client's representation. Oh, what is confidential information? Very good. Now, we've given a very broad definition of what you and I consider to be confidential information, but uh, there's a change to the dual agency part of what is considered confidential information that happens in uh, when this law is updated. So, for example, you tell me if this is, let's just uh, a quick tangent, uh, illegal or legal. When representing a seller in dual agency, telling another company agent the seller would take less. In a dual agency situation, that is not allowed. Right. It's it against the law. That is against the law. It is 100% stupid 100% of the time. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, against the law, dual agency. The flip side of that is when representing a buyer in dual agency, telling the listing agent, the agent representing the seller, the buyer would pay more. Also stupid. But illegal under dual agency. Correct. So under the, the new revision, the law has been expanded to define what is confidential information. Confidential. Confidential information that cannot be disclosed in a dual agency transaction that is now illegal to disclose in a dual agency transaction. That includes any information related to one of the principal's financial position, their motivations, their bargaining position, or other personal information that may impact price. So one of my um, one of my all time least favorite questions in this business is when people say, why is the seller selling? And I've always felt like, you know, maybe they're getting divorced and that, or maybe they lost their job and they can't pay the mortgage anymore. It has nothing to do with the property, but it has to do with the seller's motivation. And now in dual agency, you have the cover from answering none of your business, right? Right, and it's an interesting you know, situation. Um, dual agency is the extreme example where these actions are codified as being illegal. But you and I have always run our business in our brokerage that regardless of when it's illegal, it's just dumb. Thank you, and we don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, We've had clients getting divorced and they're selling, and we have disclosed that when they've given us permission to say, right. Yeah, but we don't just we don't put it on the marketing statement like, "Hey, divorce sale." See, and this is a, an actual great example of market value slash personal value because when we talk about market value, you know, you can go to any number of websites and they will give you the the rational market value for that property. But when we talk about personal value for a buyer, it's things like, oh, you know, extra sunny, open floor plan, perfect location, close to wherever I work, but whatever it might be. But people are, are angling for that same side with the seller, right? You know, like whether or not you're getting a divorce has nothing to do with market value or whether or not you've been transferred out of the country or whether or not you're in contract on your next property. I mean, none of those are conditions that run with the property. Right. But everyone wants to know them because they think they give them an edge on determining personal value. And determining the seller's... Right. Like, is the, the seller's seller, personal value. Is the seller under any pressure? Does the seller need a fast sale? Something like that. Right. And that question was a lot more... Um, it came up a ton during the downturn in 08, 09. 10, 11, 12, because people thought, oh, I, this is a, this is a distressed sale and I can get a bargain because the seller's under the gun and has to get out before foreclosure starts or something. Right. And it's interesting because, you know, on the buying side, um, the listing agent, if you hold your open houses, sees the buyers and knows generally who is bringing the offer. And if we've done our job, we, you know, chatted them up a little bit, we might know some things. So we have a sense of their enthusiasm, right. right? Their commitment to this, you know, purchase. But what we don't have or what you never see is a seller, right? So the buyers are trying to figure out like how committed is the seller to this purchase, you know, but you never see them. Right. And, and nobody knows. Yeah. No, except the agent. And we're not telling. <laughs> we have we have the, the puppy dog chorus in the background today, don't we? Ah, uh, look, yes. Okay, Britton, three more questions. All right. Here we go. A personal representative acting to sell a property on behalf of a dead person. What is a trustee? Very good. 
But wait, we kind of actually have three and a half questions. <laughs> ha ha! Psych! A person designated to manage the assets in a trust. Ditto. What is a trustee? Well, then why might I be asking? Because of disclosure requirements. Yes. So one of these is exempt from completing the transfer disclosure statement in most situations or all situations. I'm not an attorney, consult your attorney, but generally speaking, is exempt from completing a transfer disclosure statement. Can I say statement. which one? Yes, you may. Do I have to say this question? No. Uh, the dead person one. The dead person one. And for bonus points, can you tell our listeners why that makes logical sense? So the transfer disclosure statement is the state uh, mandated form that is required for a seller to complete in almost every transaction, uh, almost every sale of residential property in the state of California. And when the owner has died and the owner's successor trustee is the one completing the sale, there's a very good chance that that person has never set foot in the house or has, you know, maybe it's the deceased person's son or daughter that maybe lived there when they were growing up and they've, they lived there, but they moved out 30 years ago, that type of thing. So it's not fair to expect them to be able to answer all of those questions. So therefore the successor trustee is exempt from filling it out. Correct. However, there's another type of trustee that people were like, hey, that's a trustee too, so they must be exempt. Uh, and these were the trustees who had assets in a trust. And in particular, uh, what many people do now when they purchase a home for estate planning purposes is to put it into what's known as a living trust. Correct. And living trusts have a trustee. Uh, they're also generally the person who's alive and the trust is to the benefit of. This, Brian and I have a trust. We are our own trustees. But they're not exempt <clears throat> and they never have been. And this law now clarifies and makes very clear that it's the, the dead people trustees, not the other kind, that are exempt from completing a TDS. Correct. In most situations. All right. The agent that represents the buyer. Pre AB 29, 1289, who is the selling agent? Correct. Which and how many people understood that one? Uh, zero. Eight. I mean, once you know, you get it, but it's, it just, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, you get, okay, there's the listing agent that has the listing and then there's the selling agent who brings the buyer, but selling and sellers, selling agent confuse people because it sounded so much like seller's agent when the selling agent is the agent of the buyer. Right. Because while well, the listing agent has the listing, the listing agent also represents the seller, <clears throat> not the selling agent who is the one who brings an offer to purchase the property, thus selling it and was previously referred to as the selling agent. And all of this terminology started uh, or was originally codified into California law, as I understand it, uh, before California went to dual agency. So a lot of the language was terminology uh, from seller sub-agency. Oh, that would make sense. <laughs> I mean, kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Kind of, so, makes more sense. Come glorious 2019, what will we finally call the person who represents the buyer? The buyer's agent. That. Isn't is... that just so much easier and tidier and not head scratching? Now let's take a moment and reflect on how long it took to make that progress in organized real estate. What was dual agency pass? Like 1984? Something like that. Like so 80s? Yeah. So 30 something years ago. No rush. No Why hurry? <laughs> All right. And finally, the number of days in which a buyer who receives a revised transfer disclosure statement has to cancel the contract. Right now, it's three. In the form of a question. What is... <laughs> if only you could have like... Oh, Oh, you can't have little eye rolling emojis in radio, can you? I will ask the we'll ask them we'll ask them to put one in. So as of now it's three days, but it is being revised to five days. That is correct. And uh, apparently it also clarifies that sending something via email 
electronic mail is the same as sending it via postal mail in terms <clears throat> for purposes of being sent. And it also changes when the clock starts a ticking from when sent to when received. Oh. Yeah. So we're not attorneys. Uh, you know, um, your mileage may vary. That's how we understand it. So those are some exciting terminology changes. Is there such thing as an exciting terminology well, change? I'm like you know, I'm pretty easily amused and I'm kind of excited by not having to say selling agent anymore, say buyer's agent. You know what this means, Breton. That my committee has some work to do? No, well, there's there's that. Slacker. No. What? It means that like we are now really old real estate agents. We can be like, ah, oh, you remember when, back when I started, the buyer's agent was called the selling agent. No one understood it. And it had to walk uphill both directions in the snow to the real estate office. Well, yeah, someone <laughs> called me the other day to ask me about a listing. And then he said, and I wanted to ask you something else about something going on in the market. And he said, yeah, I wanted to talk to some older agents like you. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm old. You're like, uh, oh, driving through a bad cell area. <laughs> yeah. Lost the call. Excuse me, the battery just died in my hearing aid. <laughs> Oh, Sorry. I was showing a house in District 3, south, uh, Southwest San Francisco, uh, and it was uh, a trustee sale, speaking of, and on the back of the door was a sign that said, Martha, don't forget your hearing aids. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and on that note, we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Uh, leave us a, a five-star review on your favorite platform. We really appreciate it. See you next time. Esker Out Loud is a weekly podcast about San Francisco real estate from the Jackson Fuller team, San Francisco realtors since 2002. Show notes with links are at jacksonfuller.com. Oh.